the congregation shivered in the cold. Notre Dame echoed with the sounds of 400 musicians and singers. The young man born on the island of Corsica moved impatiently forward. Napoleon Bonaparte, 35 years old, was about to be crowned Emperor of France. I found the crown of France in the gutter, he said, and I picked it up. It was December 2nd, 1804. Within three years, Napoleon's conquests would extend his empire across almost all of Europe, and he would rule over 70 million people. Not since the ancient Caesars had one man held so much power. Napoleon changed the world. Here is a man who rises, not on the basis of his blood, not on the basis of his background, but on the basis of his ability. No one else has appeared like him, has dominated the world like he has. What is Napoleon? It's a hand in a shirt. It's a strange hat. If you show the hat, if you show the hand in the shirt, in Japan, the United States, or France, everybody will say Napoleon. Napoleon. He was above all ambitious. He loved power. He said, I love power, like a musician loves his music. Napoleon mounted the steps to the altar alone. Seizing the crown in his own hands, he held it aloft. Then brought it to rest on his own head. In the spring of 1769, Letizia and Carlo Bonaparte were crossing the mountains that straddled the interior of the island of Corsica. They were Corsican patriots, determined to repel a French army that had invaded their tiny island nation. The Corsicans were only about 100 to 120,000 people of peasant or shepherd origin. They had very few firearms, very little gunpowder, and that was all. They had to defend themselves against the 22 million population of France, then the most advanced country in Europe. The Corsicans never stood a chance. After a year of fighting, leaving thousands dead and wounded, they were defeated and Letizia and Carlo were going home. Letizia was six months pregnant. That summer, Letizia was celebrating the Feast of the Assumption when she felt her first labor pain. Later that day, August 15, 1769, she gave birth to a son, Napoleone, Napoleone Buonaparte. Born just after the bitter French conquest, Napoleon would spend his childhood hating France, the nation he would one day rule. I was born when Corsica was perishing, Napoleon later wrote. 30,000 Frenchmen spewed onto our shores, drowning the throne of liberty in waves of blood. The 
cries of the dying, the groans of the oppressed, and tears of despair surrounded my cradle from the hour of my birth. Corsica was now a French colony. Suspended in the Mediterranean between France and Italy, for centuries Corsicans had fiercely resisted invaders, Romans, Moors, Genoese. After the French victory, Corsican rebels fled to the mountains, where they continued to fight on. But Napoleon's father, Carlo, a 23-year-old university student, readily submitted. Soon he was wearing powdered wigs, embroidered waistcoats, and silver-buckled shoes. Napoleon never forgave him for betraying his Corsican heritage. He would later say harshly that his father was rather too fond of pleasure. I think Napoleon always held a grudge against his father for having submitted. But poor Carlo, he knew he had lost the battle. He realized the French were there, so he had to live with them and make the best of it. Carlo began practicing law, won election to the Corsican assembly, and rose in the esteem of the French rulers. But Napoleon rarely had a good thing to say about him. He saved his praise for his mother. The beautiful, strong-willed Letizia. As a mother, he would say, she was without equal. He was obsessed by her, fascinated by her, praised her enormously. She was very tough and determined little woman. Thirteen times pregnant, she had eight surviving children. He says that all his success in life was due to the training she gave him. La mère. The mother. What a man, Napoleon said. She has the head of a man on the body of a woman. Carlo and Letizia owned a house in the country as well as one in the city, a mark of their status. They were Corsican aristocrats, but they were not rich. With eight children, they struggled just to get by on an island that had been impoverished for centuries. There was nothing the ambitious couple believed that Corsica could offer them or their children. Only one country could, the country that had vanquished their own, France. As a representative of the Corsican parliament, Carlo traveled to Versailles. There he saw the splendor of the French court in all its majesty. France was the envy of Europe. Great Britain, Austria, Prussia, Spain, none had more people or greater wealth. While America was just beginning its experiment with democracy, Versailles gave testimony to the power of kings. Carlo was an awestruck provincial. Rumblings of discontent with King Louis XVI and aristocratic privilege were no concern of his. That Queen Marie Antoinette and a frivolous court were draining France of precious resources did nothing to diminish Carlo's delight in everything he saw. He dreamed that one day his children would become noblemen in that glittering citadel of power in which he had no place. For years, Carlo had nourished a plan. In Versailles, he saw it come true. He secured Napoleon a scholarship to a school in France. Napoleon set foot in France for the first time in the winter of 1778 a thin, sallow nine-year-old, accustomed to the warmth of the Mediterranean, suddenly alone on the windswept plains of northern France. A scholarship boy at the Royal Military College at Brienne-le-Chateau. He could hardly speak French. For the next five years, there would be no holidays, no visits home. He had no love of France, 
he still thought of himself as a grudging subject of an alien king. He thinks of himself as a Corsican. He is surrounded by students who are the children of French aristocrats. And they have nothing in common with this little foreigner. And since he is quite proud, he becomes a loner. Napoleon would one day turn his sympathies toward France, but not without years of resentment and struggle. He was 15 when he was promoted to the Royal Military Academy in Paris. Along with the sons of some of France's greatest families, he would learn the splendors of French civilization. The Royal Academy was as much a finishing school, turning officers into gentlemen as a war college. We were magnificently fed and served, Bonaparte said, treated in every way like officers possessed of great wealth. The poor Corsican teenager still felt like an outsider. He had entered a world of opulence and luxury, but it only served to fuel his scorn for the privilege and snobbery of the French nobility. One teacher described him as quiet and solitary, frightfully egotistical, proud, ambitious, aspiring to everything. He would go far, his school report read, in favorable circumstances. He began his apprenticeship as a soldier when he was 16, a lowly second lieutenant, training with the best artillery unit in the French army. He grew expert at sighting a gun, handling rammer and shot, deploying men. One of the greatest careers in military history had begun. He feels that the regime will not let him have the position he dreams of. The top positions are reserved for the noblemen. While Napoleon comes from minor nobility, poor people. Frustrated in his military ambitions, Bonaparte dreamed of becoming famous as an author, wrote a brief history of Corsica, even tried his hand at a novel. He knows that he's capable of great things. He feels that perhaps he's destined for greatness. But at that point, how can he possibly believe it? He's bored to death. Always alone among men, Bonaparte wrote, I come home to dream by myself and to give myself over to all the forces of my melancholy. My thoughts dwell on death. What fury drives me to wish for my own destruction? No doubt because I see no place for myself in this world. It was the revolution that would set Bonaparte free. July 14, 1789, Paris erupted. Angry crowds stormed through the streets, crying liberty, equality, brotherhood. France was thrown into turmoil. The monarchy itself tottered on the edge of destruction. A defiant National Assembly challenged the absolute right of the king, stripped nobles and clergy of their ancient feudal privileges, fracturing a social order that had endured for centuries. After years of injustice and inequality, the revolution had begun. It would take years before it would end. As the revolution gained momentum, Bonaparte was serving in the army far from Paris. 
He distrusted the violent mobs, but welcomed the changes transforming the country. He is certainly not a revolutionary before the beginning of the revolution. But Bonaparte welcomes the revolution as good news. It almost has a religious impact for him. Because all of a sudden he feels that the revolution is going to open up French society. It would abolish privileges, put an end to hierarchies and the kind of condescension from which Napoleon had suffered while he was growing up. Bonaparte was a man of his times, and to be 20 years old in 1789 is very important. Napoleon's destiny and the destiny of the whole country become the same. In the summer of 1792, Bonaparte was on leave in Paris and witnessed the last gasp of the French monarchy. In June, a mob stormed the Tuileries Palace and forced the king to wear the red revolutionary bonnet. In August, the mob massacred the king's Swiss guard. King Louis XVI was dethroned. French Republic was proclaimed that fall. Bonaparte returned to France to find the French fighting among themselves. The king had been executed. The Queen and thousands more followed him to the guillotine. There were cities in revolt, uprisings in the provinces. Maximilien Robespierre was in charge now. The austere, moralizing leader suspended the Constitution, vowing to save the Republic from its enemies at any cost. The revolution turned into the terror. Torn by civil war, France was also at war with almost all of Europe. Austria, Spain, Prussia, and Great Britain were bent on destroying the new French Republic, while French radicals promised to help all peoples rise against their rulers. Reinstated in the army as an artillery captain, Bonaparte was ordered to Toulon, a city of 28,000 on the southern coast that had rebelled against the Republic throwing its port open to the English. The British fleet defended the city from the harbor. 24-year-old Bonaparte thought he knew how to drive them out. He argued that if his soldiers could seize the heights commanding the harbor, they could bombard the fleet, drive it away, and the city would fall. It was a simple plan, but none of the generals would listen. The generals in Toulon were total incompetence, or a little worse. Finally, a fairly competent general showed up, listened to Napoleon's plans, and said, naturally. This would be Bonaparte's first great chance. With aristocratic officers fleeing the country, there was suddenly a vacuum, an opportunity for rapid promotion for soldiers who could prove themselves under fire. Bonaparte fought bravely, leading his men in the assault on the fort guarding the heights, suffering a wound in the thigh from an enemy bayonet. Ten ships went up in flames. The British fled. Toulon was recaptured and Bonaparte promoted. In just three months, he had risen from captain to brigadier general. The 
Republic continued to fight for its life, still clashing with enemies beyond its borders, still in turmoil at home. With France in chaos, threatened on all sides, Robespierre showed no mercy in his efforts to bring about unity and order. Liberty, he said, cannot be secured unless criminals lose their heads. Determined to make his voice heard, Bonaparte wrote a political tract in support of Robespierre. The young soldier hated the terror, but he hated chaos even more. Bonaparte is really a man of order. For him, order has to serve ideals, exactly the idea of Robespierre. It is necessary to suspend liberties in the name of liberty. In order to save liberty, to save the Republic, it's necessary to suspend individual liberties. In the summer of 1794, Robespierre's government fell. Now it was the turn of those who made the terror to die, including Robespierre. Bonaparte seemed to have come to a dead end. He was desperate for promotion, but no one paid any attention. If this continues, he wrote his brother, I shall end by not stepping aside when a carriage rushes past. Then political turmoil once again gave him his chance. On October 5, 1795, crowds of Parisians stormed through the streets alongside National Guardsmen bent on restoring the monarchy. The rebellion threatened to topple the Republic. The government called on Bonaparte to repel the attack. There wasn't much other choice, actually, when this rebellion broke. There aren't any competent generals in Paris. Here's young Bonaparte. He's a man of uh, conviction. Uh, put him in. Napoleon was not one to pussyfoot around. He would use all his weapons. Nobody had really used cannon on the Paris mobs before. He was going to shoot. He waited until they could see the whites of their eyes. The enemy attacked us, Bonaparte wrote his brother. We killed a great many of them. Now all is quiet. I could not be happier. Three weeks later, he was made a full general, commander of the Army of the Interior. He was 26. Bonaparte was sent to the Italian Alps. Josephine's former lover, Paul Barat, had helped win him an appointment as supreme commander of all French forces in Italy. His assignment was to challenge the Empire of Austria, and their Italian allies. He had never commanded an army before. Young and untested, no one expected very much from him, especially his own generals. Everyone makes fun of him before he gets there. This little general who perhaps owes his command to his wife. Then he arrives, and within a few moments, the veterans who made fun of him understand exactly. He is in charge. I don't know why, one of his generals said, but the little bastard scares me. Bonaparte's army was in no condition to win battles. It had been stagnating under incompetent commanders in the foothills of the Alps for almost two years. Soldiers, he proclaimed, you are naked and ill-fed. No fame shines upon you. I will lead you into the most fertile plains in the world. 
Rich provinces, great cities will lie in your power. You will find there honor, glory, and riches. He really enthralls them. He's a terrific actor. He is capable of laughing, smiling, and then suddenly he is passionate, inspiring fear, horror, and anger. On April 2, 1796, Bonaparte led his army forward. He was badly outnumbered. 38,000 French soldiers faced 38,000 Austrians and their allies, 25,000 Piedmontese. Bonaparte planned to isolate the Austrians from the Piedmontese, then conquer each separately. He would strike first at Piedmont. In just two weeks, he won six battles, took thousands of prisoners, and broke the back of Piedmont's army. One Piedmontese officer would later complain, they sent a young madman who attacks right, left, and from the rear. It's an intolerable way of making war. On April 26th, Piedmont surrendered. Bonaparte demanded gold and silver and paid his troops, the first real money they had seen in years. Soldiers, he said, we thank you. With Piedmont defeated, Bonaparte was now pursuing the Austrians, who retreated to the east, bewildered by the 26-year-old general and his new way of making war. In the 18th century, there were nobles commanding on both sides, and they had a, a certain code. The armies would maneuver, and very often, if one had the other in check, that would be the end of it. There would be no fight. Napoleon was, in a way, the first modern general. He did not accommodate those old codgers on the other side uh, at all. He attacks every day. He attacks when it snows, he attacks at night, he attacks when it's cold. It's not the way the game is played. He looks for the enemy, fights it, and when they assume that he's going to stop, he continues. The next day, he fights again. It surprises them. As the Austrians fled, their rear guard hoped to slow Bonaparte down by making a stand at the little Italian town of Lodi. They fortified a narrow wooden bridge with 14 cannon and three battalions and dared Bonaparte to cross it. The general ordered a simple frontal assault on the bridge. Everything would depend on the courage of his men. He had earned their admiration with his rapid string of victories. Now he would find out if he also had their faith. How do you incite men to do something like that? It's charisma. I mean, he got tremendous presence. Napoleon was a master at motivating his soldiers. Victory always goes a long way. The more they win, the harder they get to stop. His troops were pretty well hepped up. They'd been chasing Austrians now for weeks, and uh, they went forward. There are no tactics at all. The troops come in so enthusiastically and quickly, it surprises the enemy. It's just a question of enthusiasm. Everyone throws themselves into it. Everyone risks death. With his men facing withering enemy fire, Bonaparte was in the thick of it. He was actually up there laying in the cannon, which was a corporal's job. But he was always up there with them. 
This is a man with absolute courage. He's wherever he's needed. If he's needed up at the very front to encourage people, he's there. He, he takes, takes physical risks. Even if cannonballs fall close to him, and this happened on several occasions, he's not afraid. The French made it halfway across the bridge and fell back under a vicious hail of fire. Then one last charge and they were across. Austrian guns fell silent. Here they thought they were safe behind the river, holding the bridge. You know, once the French come across the bridge and beat the living of Jesus out of them. It's a real spectacular job. It wasn't a big battle. The casualties were not particularly heavy. But he had imposed his will on his own men and the enemy, both. It was not a great victory. The Austrian army had, in fact, escaped. But Bonaparte had won the respect and devotion of his men. He came out all sweaty and grimy and covered with gun smoke. The troops liked that. They began calling him the little corporal right there. It was. You identify with us. You're, you're, you're our corporal. This is the moment when he becomes convinced that he has a lucky star. And that destiny has chosen him to accomplish great things. They haven't seen anything yet, Bonaparte told one of his generals. In our time, no one has the slightest conception of what is great. It is up to me to give them an example. There was a spark. The battle at Lodi convinced Napoleon Bonaparte that he was a man of destiny. From that moment, he said, I foresaw what I might be. Already I felt the earth flee from beneath me, as if I were being carried into the sky. At the end of 1797, 28-year-old Napoleon Bonaparte returned to Paris and handed the government a treaty which brought a fragile peace to the continent of Europe. Now, only Great Britain remained at war with France. In just one and a half years, he had taken his dispirited, tattered soldiers, marched them hundreds of miles, and defeated the army of the Empire of Austria without ever losing a battle. The French were hungry for a hero someone who could put an end to the political chaos into which the revolution had descended. One government after another had come and gone. Now they lived under a new one, the Directory. The Directory was an unstable, fragile parliamentary government that commanded no confidence. All of France turned toward Bonaparte, wondering what he would do next. What I have done up to now is nothing, he said privately. I am only at the beginning of the course I must run. I can no longer obey. I have tasted command, and I cannot give it up. While Bonaparte waited for the right moment to seize power, he set his sights on new glories in the exotic East. He eluded a British fleet, and on July 1st, 1798, landed with 35,000 soldiers in Egypt. France was still at war with Great Britain and Bonaparte hoped to disrupt British trade routes to India. In 
1798, Egypt was still a source of wonder to most Europeans. The souks crowded with Turks and Jews, Syrians and Greeks. The minarets sounding the call of an alien religion. The Sphinx with its broken nose buried in the sand up to its neck. Bonaparte finds himself in a country of legends, myths, and a great history. But it was really madness on his part, because all of the military calculations at the time held that it was impossible for a European army to conquer the East. Bonaparte quickly captured Alexandria. And then on July 3rd, led his soldiers across the desert toward Cairo and a looming battle. For centuries, the Egyptians had been part of the Turkish Empire, ruled by the fiercest warriors in the Middle East, the Mamelukes. Remarkable for their courage, pride, and cruelty, the Mamelukes waited fearlessly for the French armies. One Mameluk prince called them donkey boys. The Mamelukes charged a cannon with their sabers and their horses, with arms from the Middle Ages. It was a meeting between the Europe of the future and the Egypt of the past. Napoleon just organized his army into five gigantic squares. These are men kneeling and standing and firing, so you've got a continual rolling fire. The uh, Mamelukes rode around the squares and were shot at by that square and by this square. The French lost 30 men. The Mamelukes lost uh, probably five or 6,000. The Battle of the Pyramids was over in an hour. Three days later, Bonaparte led his army into Cairo. I was full of dreams, he said. I saw myself founding a new religion, marching into Asia riding an elephant, a turban on my head, and in my hand, the new Koran. But Bonaparte's dreams of empire were quickly shattered. The British Admiral Horatio Nelson caught the French fleet anchored off the Egyptian coast and blew it to pieces. Bonaparte and 35,000 soldiers were trapped in Egypt. The only link that he had with France were his ships his fleet of warships. You can imagine what a disaster this was. He was forced to stay in Egypt and live with the Egyptians, to find his bread and water in Egypt, and even find ammunition for his weapons in Egypt, to live in Egypt. On August 23, 1799, Bonaparte secretly set sail for home, abandoning more than 30,000 soldiers with little more than an apologetic message. Extraordinary circumstances alone have persuaded me to pass through enemy lines and return to Europe. France was once again at war with Austria, Britain, and Russia. Civil war continued to tear the country apart. The government in Paris was in disarray. Already there were rumors of an impending coup. Bonaparte dreamed of rescuing France, but feared he had not moved fast enough. All great events hang by a hair, he told an aide. I believe in luck, but the wise man neglects nothing which helps his destiny.
On October 9, 1799, he landed in France and found himself greeted by cheering crowds. The campaign in Egypt, a military disaster, had been a propaganda triumph. In the theaters, what's being shown? The expedition to Egypt, the victory of the pyramids. When he arrives, he's considered the man of the hour. His genius was to come to France and say, you need a savior. Here I am. The French people believed that Napoleon was destined to do great things. In all the engravings of the period, you see the two frigates which brought Napoleon from Egypt. And above the first frigate, a star. Back in France, less than a week, Bonaparte saw that the time had come to act. Solemnly deliberating in the Luxembourg Palace, the Directory was about to be swept aside. The debt from eight long years of war was mounting, draft evasion rampant. Bandits roamed the highways in the countryside. The government seemed powerless. Already, there were schemes to overthrow it. As the crisis ripened, Bonaparte determined to find a way to seize power for himself. His moment, he knew, had arrived. He allied himself with one of the plotters, a member of the directory, Emmanuel Siez, who needed the support of the popular young general. This coup that Siez plans is a parliamentary coup, a political coup. Siez is the master of Siez is in charge, and force will only be used if something goes wrong. General Bonaparte is only supposed to have a supporting role in this coup. On November 9, 1799, Bonaparte and Siez set their plot in motion. It's really a very simple premise, that the parliament will put itself out of business, they will vote in a provisional government that will, in effect, start over again, draft a new constitution. They expect that the bayonets will never be unsheathed and a shot uh, will never be fired. For the coup to have an air of legitimacy, Bonaparte and Siez wanted the legislators to vote them into power. They didn't want to seize it. Bonaparte counted on the help of his brother Lucien, who had been elected president of the lower house of the legislature as a result of his brother's popularity. But Lucien was powerless to persuade the council to dissolve the government. They run into real opposition. The opposition insist uh, that every deputy renew his oath of allegiance to the existing constitution, which they do. It takes over two hours to do this. Meanwhile, the key plotters waiting outside in the wings, as it were, are getting very uh, agitated, and particularly General Bonaparte, who eventually just loses patience and decides that he must intervene to speed things up. He enters the legislative house. This is strictly against the law. The legislature is barred to uh, any uh, outside military figure. And what he encounters there is, is genuine rage. The members of the assembly, they, they see these bayonets and that bearskin hats marching down the main aisle with Bonaparte in between them. And they begin to shout and scream, outlaw him, outlaw him. He's trying to take over the government. And his brother, Lucien. I said, wait a minute, my brother's not trying to take over the government. Calm down. And they say, we want him outlawed, we want him outlawed. Bonaparte never gets to utter a word uh, to, the, to the deputies. Uh, and he is, in effect, hustled out by the grenadiers who had come in with him uh, and uh, is quite badly shaken by this. Bonaparte had bungled. The coup seemed lost. His chance for power finished. When some of his own soldiers began to doubt their general's intentions, 
his brother Lucien took control of the chaotic situation. Lucien sees that Napoleon is going to miss the moment. He has the drums beat. He draws his sword. He walks over to Napoleon. He presses the, the point of the, of the sword, Napoleon's chest, and he said, believe me, soldiers of France, if Napoleon aspired to take over the government to be dictator, I'd run him through. The soldiers stormed the assembly hall. The cowed legislators fled, some jumping unceremoniously out the windows. At two o'clock that morning, a small rump of the council, in league with the plotters, reassembled and voted into law a new provisional government with three provisional consuls at its head. Bonaparte was one of them. This triumvirate is only a facade. Le coup de the parliamentary coup had become a military coup. Et fort qui était and the strong man is no longer Siez, now it is Bonaparte. Bonaparte. Within weeks, Bonaparte outmaneuvered the other consuls, rewrote the constitution, and made himself head of state under the title First Consul. As the year 1800 began, Napoleon Bonaparte, 30 years old, was the most powerful man in France. The revolution, Bonaparte said, is over. And then he added, I am the revolution. War had catapulted Bonaparte into power. Now, war would help him secure it. France was still fighting Great Britain and Austria. Bonaparte conceived a daring plan to catch the Austrians by surprise. In the spring of 1800, he took his soldiers over the Alps. 40,000 men, field artillery, trekking across treacherous layers of snow and ice through the great St. Bernard Pass. Not since the Carthaginian general Hannibal had an army attempted such an outlandish offensive. It's 10,500 feet high. They dragged their guns in pine trees, they hauled it out like canoes, and they took off across the mountains. On May 20th, Bonaparte made the crossing himself. Jacques-Louis David memorialized the adventure in his heroic portrait of Napoleon, mounted on a gleaming stallion. In fact, Bonaparte crossed the Alps riding a sure-footed mule. It took the general and his army just six days. On the morning of June 14th, he faced the Austrians at Marengo. 45 miles from Milan. By the end of the day, there were 6,000 French casualties. But nearly twice as many Austrians had been killed or wounded. The French had won. My power depends on my glory, Bonaparte said and my glory on my victories. Early the next year, the Emperor of Austria ordered a halt to the fighting and signed a treaty with France. Great Britain followed the year after. For the first time in 10 years, all of Europe was at peace. 
Ça fait six mois seulement que Bonaparte, Bonaparte a été en pouvoir juste six mois. Et les gens de France ont vu d'autres régimes politiques qui ont duré seulement un an. Ils ont dit, bah, peut-être que Bonaparte ne durera pas. Après Marengo, ce n'est plus After Marengo, things changed. Ordinary people, as well as people in the ruling class, now thought Bonaparte would last. Now Bonaparte moved to consolidate his rule. At his urging, the French constitution was again amended. And at 33, Bonaparte became first consul for life, with near dictatorial powers. A king in all but name. 